This is Coons Ford Turf Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turp Talk. Well, after a uh, great day over in D.C. yesterday at National Park, uh, you know, the subject there, the buzz around the stadium, not just from the 5,000 Baltimore fans that, that were there, but the buzz was about Manny Machado. The deal was done. Stan calls me up at uh, Stan. The fan calls me up around four o'clock or texts me and says the deal's not done. So I said, "Come on the show, Stan. Tell us what's up, Stan. Get us up to date." How you doing, Bruce? Doing great, buddy. I'm in my car and the Bluetooth is not sounding really loud, but uh, I will uh, endeavor to explain what's going on the best I can. You're, you, uh, sound thing, you sound perfect. You sound perfect. What's that? You sound perfect. Thank you. Um, have I never sounded perfect before? You've I'm had, you've had I'm your kidding. moments. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, it, it sounded last night that the, both sides, the uh, Orioles and the Dodgers, were moving ever closer to a deal. And as we know, in Baltimore, and uh, is known throughout Major League Baseball circles, that when a team enters into an agreement with the Orioles, that's, that's reached one threshold. And the next threshold that it has to meet is that it, uh, the players that are coming back to Baltimore pass their, uh, pass the medical mustard. And, uh, there apparently has been a glitch in a, one of the fringe players. Um, the, the two key players that were mentioned last night, Bruce, were an outfielder, 21 year old Cuban outfielder named Unil, Unil Diaz. Uh, from Havana, Cuba, uh, the Dodgers apparently paid him big money about three, four years ago, about $15 million signing bonus. So uh, you see this is one way to get around of investing heavily in the uh, Latin market is just to trade your best players for teams that have invested heavily in the Latin market. Anyway, this kid is a, a real nice player. He's um, 6'1". Uh, about 195 pounds. I like where he's moved from A ball to double A. I see a lot of improvement from last year to this year. Uh, he seems pretty set in the deal. Now, the other big name, and, and by the way, Diaz is the number three prospect in the Dodger organization. The other player that's name arose last night was a pitcher, 6'6", 20-year-old pitcher, he was their third pick in 2016. His name is Dustin May. Now, I was filling in on the Glenn Clark show today, and one of Glenn's on vacation on our website, and one of our guests was Jerry Hairston, who is kind of like the now the Rick Dempsey of Dodger baseball on TV. He's on the pre- and post-game shows out there. He was shocked to hear that Dustin's, Dustin May's name was involved in this deal. Shocked in a good way if you're an Oriole fan, but he was like, I cannot believe they are including him in this deal. He is their number eight prospect. Uh, As the day evolved and we kept waiting for this, and, and we've heard rumors that as many as five players are coming back to the Orioles, okay? Uh, the third player was a 20-year-old or 21-year-old infielder named Errol e- E-R-R-O-L Robinson. He's kind of more like a slick defender. His uh, minor league numbers, and he's playing at double A right now. They're, they don't blow you off the, off the course, but uh, they're not horrible. But he's like a throw-in in this deal, uh, clearly. And now this is where it gets interesting as the day evolved today, and we kept waiting and thinking we were going to see this this thing announced as a done deal, um, it just has never been announced as a done deal. And then about 2 o'clock this afternoon, Steve Phillips on um, XM Radio, tweet, the former general manager of the Mets, tweets out that there apparently is a holdup on the medicals, of a player coming back to the Orioles, a player or players coming back to the Orioles. So that's where we were essentially about three hours into that or four hours into that. 
It does not mean that the deal is not going to happen. It does complicate it a little bit because of the, you know, the all-star uh, break is over now. Uh, Manny Machado would have been on a plane probably late today or tomorrow morning at their latest to fly to Milwaukee, which Milwaukee hosts the Dodgers uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday there. And I'm sure he's on pins and needles waiting for this thing to go down as uh, official, and we don't know exactly what the nature of the medical issue is. And uh, I can only confirm, really, that Diaz is part of the deal. Uh, It's interesting, in things that I read later in the day, I have not seen May's name involved in the deal. That doesn't mean I haven't seen any other names. And that may be one of the reasons that they don't mention names is in case there's a um, fly in the ointment here or, you know, something goes awry, they'd rather not have all these players know that they've been traded and then they're not traded. So that's where we stand right now, Bruce. Well, you know, uh, we all know that the uh, Orioles physical is equivalent to a Navy SEAL physical. Right or or an army yeah. range, or an army ranger f- uh, physical. I mean, yeah, you know, we we knew that when Peter was really running the show. The 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 vibe we have gotten throughout the last six months is that he is not really that active in in things right now. I'm not saying that all of a sudden they would just pass a guy immediately, but you thought maybe it wouldn't be as strenuous or whatever. But maybe the boys uh, uh, like that part of their father's game plan. I don't know. I haven't heard the the details of what's wrong, uh, whether this player is that important or they can just swap out this player for another. For another, it sounds like these guys are the guys that are sort of at rookie ball or a ball. Um, they aren't the deal breakers. It seems like Diaz and um, this Dustin May would be a hell of a haul for Manny Machado. Well, it sounds like a phenomenal deal, Stan. Uh, real quick, before I let yeah. you go, have you heard anything that Manny's cybermetric numbers at shortstop are very weak? Yeah, I wouldn't call them cybermetric, uh, sabermetric. Sabermetric, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, the metrics on him defensively are not good at shortstop. I Listen, I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you how to figure out the cybermetrics. I'm old school. I see my my eyeballs. My mother used to have a line when one of her neighbors thought one of her our neighbors thought uh, her husband was having an affair with my my mother. She the woman said, "I know what my eyes see." Uh, so I know what my eyes see as sort of a little bit of a baseball scout, and I can tell you that I thought Manny was absolutely terrible the first fifty games of this year. I'd say the last 30 games, what the biggest change to me is he's realized that when a ball's hit to him, he's got to move quicker to the ball, and he doesn't have all the time in the world because balls are not hit as they don't get to shortstop as fast as they do third base. So third baseman always has tremendous amount of time because the ball's hit hard. When a ball takes four or five, six hops, to Manny, it's short. He can't wait for the, the the ball, depending upon who the runner is, and then think he's going to out throw the runner. And I've seen him mess up his clock five, six times earlier in the year, maybe four times, five times. Um, I'd say the last three weeks, uh, I think Manny has gotten a little bit more of the urgency. And it's not urgency, it's just the correct timing down. And you know what? In fairness to him, I was not in favor of them moving him to short. I thought it was idiotic. But in fairness to him, he hadn't really played the position in five, six years, seven years. So he's getting reacclimated to it. I think he can be a good shortstop. He's not going to be defensively. He'll never win a gold glove at short, in my estimation. Listen, uh, it hurt the team bad. When he moved away from third, it seemed like every yeah, game, no, uh, every game yeah. I went to when he was at third, hit, there'd yeah. be a play that you see. How could he make that play? And yeah, it, it hasn't was, happened. It was short. really terrible. It that hasn't terrible. happened in short. All right, Stan, yeah. I'll let you go. I know you have a meeting. Thanks a lot for coming. Right. On. Keep me abreast. My pleasure. All right, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. All right.
Let's move on to uh, tomorrow's a big day, of course, is the beginning of the Open Championship at Carnoustie. And we bring in my good buddy, Pat Coiner, teaching pro over at BCC. Pat, another Bruce. another major, brother. That's it. We're on again. Well, uh, I got a lot to say about this one. A lot to say because okay. looking, first of all, I think it might have been you that one time when I went to Scotland and I said I was going to play Carnoustie, you right. said to me, save your money, it's too tough. I th- uh, it was me. I said something to that effect, right? Right. And because, I mean, this was after I played Royal Troon, mm-hmm. which was an absolute, like, throwing money in the toilet. It was so tough. It was, <laughs> you know, the opening hole, you're, you got to drive 200 yards over the burn. You know, yep. it, it, it didn't make any sense. It just not, you know, the ability's not there. Mm-hmm. And uh, we remember what happened, John Vandervelt. We've seen some of the winning scores at Troon. Yes. 12 yep. over, 8 over. And for all that reason, to me, right now, I look at about three or four guys who I think could win this tournament. Mm-hmm. And uh, only one American. One of them is Justin Rose. I think he's got to be the favorite. Yeah, he, he's. I, I think he he's not the betting favorite right now, but I think as far as uh, I don't want to say common sense, but he uh, he's my favorite. I know he is usually, but for this week especially, he's definitely and who I would certainly, pick. Certainly, to leave out Tommy Fleetwood after the way right. he's been playing would be a major mistake. And I think right. to leave out Ricky Fowler because Ricky Fowler's got every phase of the game you need to tackle Carnoustie. Yes. Right. He drives uh, the bar big. He's got a lot of imagination. He plays great into the wind. Yep. And, and he's uh, a phenomenal putter. I mean, to me, you know, and I also throw in Brooks uh, Kepka, but to mm-hmm. see Dustin Johnson as favorite, to me, doesn't make any sense. Right. And, uh, and he is. He's the betting favorite right now. I, I certainly expect him to. You know, to be on the, you know, in the top twenty or whatnot. But I, I don't. You know, going into the Masters, you know, in certain years, especially last year, I mean, he was by far the favorite. Um, I thought even going into the U.S. Open, uh, you know, I thought he and and probably Justin Rose were the were the the huge favorites. But I don't I don't see. I know he's the number one player in the world. He's capable of winning any week. But I I wouldn't count him as the favorite this week. Yeah, I I don't I don't see it. And I think Rory Rory has been too helter skelter. Mm-hmm. I mean, he certainly yep. could win this tournament, and that goes for uh, Jordan Spieth as well. He's right, been totally inconsistent. And uh, Tiger is always in there. He's seventeen yeah. to one, which in a tournament like this is means he's one of the favorites. Right, and right. Uh, I think another guy we got to look at is Brooks Kepka because he's Definitely. been incredible. Yeah, no, he's been phenomenal, and he he has a ton of confidence right now. And and from what I'm hearing is the. Uh, you know, the guys can adopt one of two theories. Some of the guys are going to lay back and avoid some of the trouble off the tee with short clubs. But I've heard a number of the longer hitters, and Kepka certainly is one of them, talking about, hey, wait a minute, we might just take driver and just hit it over everything. And if we're in a little bit of rough, it's, you know, it, it's not that big of a deal. So uh, I think you're going to see a lot of different game plans this week, and it's interesting to, to see which one pans out. You know, it's funny. I, I read in the Scottish Open, I didn't see it, where uh, Ricky Fowler hit a drive because of the hard pan, 428 <laughs> yards. Right, right. Is that conceivable? <laughs> it is. It is. And, and I hear that Carnoustie uh, right now is as hard and fast as it's been in – in as long as anyone can remember. So they've had hot, dry weather over there and the ball. I know Dustin Johnson hit a drive like I I won't get the number exactly right, but somewhere in the 450 yard range yesterday in a practice round. Wow. Yeah, it's really running. It's like playing on a runway. What does this mean? You know, I, it's funny. I was playing golf today, and I and uh, had about a 150 yard shot. You'll know on the 16. And that's mm-hmm. a lot for me. And I hit a nice, a nice uh, uh, four rescue. And right. normally I would just get there. Today, it ran through the green over the green. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. never, I mean, it never happened. So every course is taking the beating of the dryness. 
Correct. Yeah, it's it's amazing how far when when you all of a sudden have to factor in roll for your approach shots. That's a whole different ball game. And and I think where you were probably going with this is okay. Does this favor a certain type of player? Um. You know, at the end of the day, they're all playing the same golf course, but I think what it does is it brings a number of the, you know, the so-called shorter hitters back into play. The Zach Johnsons, the Russell Knox of the world, these guys, all of a sudden, they're going to be hitting balls out there 300, 350 yards, so they're going to have shorter clubs into the green as well. Well, you know, you you think about some guys who've won the British Open. I think uh, I think of Zach Johnson, and I think mm-hmm. of... Uh, uh, with Justin Leonard, did he win one? Sure, yeah, yeah, 1997. Right, and these were all short hitters, but they were right. they were like concise hitters, like Freddie Funk. Right. I mean, they always hit the ball straight. Mm-hmm. And when you do that at a course like this, there's just a tremendous advantage. Yeah, huge advantage. And, uh, you know, it's uh, yeah, Zach Johnson won at uh, St. Andrews, and uh, you mentioned Justin Leonard. He won in 97, but people forget that he well, he was in the playoff with Vanderbilt in 99 when uh, Paul Laurie ended up winning. So, you know, Justin Leonard, some shorter hitters have really had had some success uh, in this championship. We think about that final 18th hole where uh, uh, Vanderbilt went in with a three-shot lead. Mm-hmm. And have you ever been in a situation where you hit 18 with a pretty safe lead and you think to yourself, well, if I go and it's a par five and if I go three, you know, mm-hmm. three clubs, 150 yards, if that's your wheelhouse club, you know, yeah. you're, you're on the green. Has that ever presented in your mind? Yeah, and the the interesting thing is, and one of the reasons why, one of the many reasons why golf's so hard is that if you find yourself in that position, all of a sudden it's really easy to get out of your game plan and you start trying to avoid making mistakes rather than standing up there and trying to hit good golf shots. Um, and people could argue one method over the other, but uh, what really changes is that you know, you're no longer being aggressive towards your targets, regardless of what club you're hitting. But uh, big leads are, they should be easy to play with, but sometimes they're even harder because you, you're just trying to avoid the, you know, the quote-unquote train wreck that we we saw happen with Vanderbilt. Michael Kim, now, you know, I, I, mm-hmm. I realize these guys are hitting the ball far. How do you mm-hmm. score 26 under on a course? My gosh, I, I, he was in another world. He... You know, and he's not a big hitter at all. He just had one of those weeks where he hit it fantastically, and he and he made everything he looked at, and he just was in the the zone for four days. Um, that was fun be, to watch. Who would be a guy like that to come out of like who you don't expect to win outside of maybe the Zach Johnsons of the world yeah. or whatever? Who would be that kind of guy who might pop up because of his I, consistency? I, I personally, I think Francesco Molinari has a great chance this week. He's, uh, you know, he's not a super well-known, you know, golfer to most of us. Um, he is an incredibly straight hitter of the ball. He's become a pretty good putter. He's on, he's on really good form recently. He just won a couple of weeks ago uh, here locally at Avenel by a lot, by eight or ten shots. He had won the previous week, I believe, in France on the European tour. Um, he's a guy that's been a, a great ball striker for a long time, and now he's starting to make putts and, and gain some confidence. I think Molinari could be a, a bit of a dark horse this week. Molinari has chosen to play on the U.S. tour, is that correct? Or does he just play he, on the European tour enough to play Ryder Cup? Yeah, he is definitely playing more over here now than he used to. I think he's still, by and large... Um, you know, would play more on the European tour, but you're definitely seeing him more over here now. And, and now that he he won um, at the uh, at the quick and loan, so I'm sure we'll be seeing him more and more. All right. So uh, we didn't mention John Rom. He certainly has been. Mm-hmm. He always is hovers around that top ten. So sure. right now, Tuesday tomorrow morning, I guess you and me will be up real early to oh, catch yeah. the early rounds. Uh, but who do you see? before we talk again on Saturday, maybe mm-hmm. getting off to a fast start in the uh, Open Championship? 
Yeah, I like uh, as as usual. A lot of it depends on the draw. You know, over there you can have a I have horrible weather in the morning and then perfect weather in the afternoon, or vice versa. So you're at the the mercy of the of the draw. But I like I like Justin Rose. Um, I like Ricky Fowler also. I think you you touched on a good one there. I like Molinari, and quite honestly, for the first time in a long time, I'm anxious to see what Tiger does. I think he could actually have a good week. That's funny. Why? What makes what? What part of his game makes you say that? I don't. I wish I had a better answer for you. It's more of a hunch than anything else. Uh, I just think he's he's striking the ball well. He hasn't been able to put four rounds together um, so far. He seems to have that odd off day. Um, it's just a hunch more than anything. And hopefully, I've been around this game long enough to where where. Uh, my hunch is uh, is accurate, but I just think he could play well this week. Uh, will he use that stinger two iron off the tee? <laughs> Absolutely should. I know that. Uh, we'll see if he does, but I think that would be a deadly shot. All right, so you're a real player of surprise, but I'm not sure how much of a surprise it is is Molinari. Cause he's- yeah, I, I think he is, he's becoming uh, – He's becoming a much more much more of a favorite than certainly than we would have talked about six months ago. Well, my only thing is, I sure hope Ricky Fowler wins. All right, because that would be great. It'd it's be such great. a plus for golf, and he's been a great sportsman. And uh, you know, he he gets along with all these guys who have won, and he hasn't, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. certainly doesn't belittle his talent. But right. uh, he's way overdue, way overdue to win. Yes. And I hope that finally comes to an end. Pat, 9 o'clock Saturday morning, we'll be in the moving day. Uh, we'll know who survived the cut. We'll know who yeah. uh, is in the lead. And then I'll really pin you down. So uh, I'm sure yep. we'll text in the interim. Oh, yeah. We will be in contact. As always, thanks for checking in, my friend. All right. Thanks. All right. This is Bruce Posner. You are listening to Coons Ford Turp Talk. This Wednesday night and every Wednesday night for the last 11 years, we will get to some Maryland stuff as we approach opening day football-wise and uh, a lot else happening in the Terrapin world. Back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Welcome back to Coons Ford Turp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. All right, welcome back to Coons Ford Turp Talk. And who else do we have on at uh, 620 every, or actually 625 tonight, every Wednesday night, than my good friend at Coons Ford, Dennis Colossus. Dennis, how are you tonight? I'm outstanding. How are you, my friend? Well, Dennis, I know you're a guy. You teach spin classes, right? <laughs> and you, you can hang and bang the weights as good as anybody. But the real question is, could you pass an oral physical? I don't think, uh, uh, you know, both can pass a manorial physical. That's the most ridiculous thing. That uh, That's why they're just so hard to do business with, Bruce. It's, it's, it's terrible. You almost wonder if it's if the Army Rangers could pass a, uh, a oral physical. Well, they have that reputation. They're just a very difficult organization to do business with. They're not user-friendly. They're not fan friendly. I mean, they've got a lot of work to do, Bruce. Yeah, they do. And uh, although this trade is supposed to be fantastic for the Orioles, and I sure hope it works out. And apparently, it's not with the key ingredients; it's with some of the uh, side ingredients. So I guess we'll see how that flies. But uh, you know, what's new on the Ravens front, Dennis? I mean, we're not that far away from uh, opening. The, I know Friday night, there, the fans are allowed to come to M and T to watch a practice. Correct. That, that is correct. And just one more quick comment about the Orioles, Bruce. I saw today where they're they're down 16 percent in attendance, and their viewership on Madison is down 50 percent. So that's that's very alarming to an organization. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it yeah. is. But it's amazing. It's even that because of the way the record is. I mean, the record the record is beyond belief. All right. Yeah, it's, all right. It's, it's terrible. But you know, we'll we'll move forward to the Ravens and lots of excitement as the veterans report to camp and uh, go along with the rookies. Uh, a lot of cause for optimism this year. It looks like Joe Flacco did get together with the receivers in the offseason, uh, slung the pillar around, as he likes to say, with uh, Willie Sneed and John Brown and Michael Crabtree and the two young tight ends. So uh, if they can come to camp with some chemistry, some some health, they could be poised for their good year. What's good about Hayden Hurst? I mean, we're hearing crazy comparisons of him to Gronk. And, you know, what comes out strong about him, our first-round pick? 
Look, at 25 years old, he's a grown man. He doesn't have an upside. He's reached his upside. What you see is what you get. He's just a, he's just a grown man ready to play ball. And great hands, great size, great speed. And with Mark Andrews, I'm really excited about Mark Andrews. He was very productive in college, uh, averaged about seven touchdowns a year. Rookie tight ends, a lot of times, Bruce, have a hard time assimilating to the speed of the game. But I think both of these guys, something tells me they're both going to be game ready on opening day. And what do you hear about you Lamar hear? Jackson? Is he furthering along his uh, uh, his education process? Yeah, what I like, what I love about Lamar Jackson is his leadership skills. Bruce, he stayed home. He didn't leave camp. He stayed at the castle. He's been working out every day. He's absorbed the playbook. The guy's a real deal. The players are really gravitated towards him. He's got a live arm and a great head on his shoulders. He's just a fine young man. He's got a great upside. If Joe Flacco has a great season uh, that we expect him to. The Ravens are going to be in real good shape in terms of uh, what they're going to do with the quarterback situation going forward. Yeah, how do you think Flacco will react to him? I mean, I mean, obviously, here's a guy who could take away his job, but that doesn't seem to be Flacco's stance or his mentality like it is Brady's. Well, Joe's got a very calm and cool demeanor about him. He's not going to make any waves. He's not going to give the press anything, any sound bites, any juicy sound bites. He's there to compete for a job. I, I think he's fired up. I think he welcomes the challenge as a competitor. He's made a ton of money, and he, you know, he, he's going to continue making a ton of money in the league. Uh, look, it is what it is, and uh, it's just Joe Cool. Business as usual, no matter what the Ravens do. He understands the organization has to protect uh, you know, their future in terms of and, and Joe's getting injured, his back and whatnot, and his age, and also his contract. It's a business, and... Uh, they're one of the best organizations in the league, uh, year in and year out. And Harbaugh, you, I mean, is he really on the clock this year? Uh, you know what? Uh, to me, John Harbaugh is a top five coach in the game. Uh, look, they've been one play away the last two seasons. He's got a 60% winning uh, percentage. If, if, if I'm the owner of the Ravens, I leave John Harbaugh alone. I think he's done a great job. Well, the Ravens, well, the Ravens over and under this year is eight. That's almost laughable, you know. In other yeah. words, if they win nine, you win. If they win eight, you push. But uh, yeah. that's, that doesn't show much respect, does it? Well, last season, Bruce, it was eight and a half. So that's what Vegas thinks. They think they're going backwards this year. And uh, I just don't think they're paying attention. You know, up in Pittsburgh, they have a situation there with Le'Veon Bell. They didn't sign him for the extension. That's not going to play real well. We don't expect to see him until the season opener. He's going to miss camp. Um, look, I, I think the division is right for the take, and I think the Bengals have uh, tapped out with uh, with their quarterback there, Andy Dalton, and the Browns are still the Browns. I think the division crown is up uh, for the taking by the Ravens. It's certainly possible, but I think the Le'Veon Bell thing is going to hurt the Steelers. And, you know, there are exceptions to the running back rule of the guys only going to last a few years. Without him, I'm not sure what that team would have won in the past few years. He is, he is just a different breed of running back. Uh, and, and how they could not get him signed is hard to believe. Well, this could get real messy, uh, Bruce, because they could also pull the franchise tag from him. Uh, and if that happens, the other thing is, that even, even with, the, with the tag, he's not uh, obligated to play in the postseason. He can just play 16 games, collect the 16 to, to 17 paychecks. And, uh, and just not play. So uh, this could get really ugly, really, really messy, really fast uh, in this situation. Uh, I sure could, but who cares? It's the Steelers. Let it happen. All right. Well, they, they have some misfortunes. My point is between the Steelers and the Bengals, I, I just don't know that this is a solid division. I think it's any, anybody can win this division except the Browns. Yeah, well, that's for sure. That's for sure. And how do you think uh, Baker Mayfield's going to do? Is he going to see the field this year? I don't see how he can. I don't see how he can't see the field. Tyrod Taylor has had a great camp. He looks good. Um, he's, I, I like Tyrod. I think you like Tyrod, but you don't draft uh, Mayfield as high as the Browns uh, did without playing him. And I think Baker's got the goods. I think he's the real deal. He was my number one ranked quarterback coming in this class and just this draft class. And uh, look, I think he'll put Fannies in his seat. I think he'll sell tickets in Cleveland. They, the, the Browns, are, I mean, the fan base, they're excited. Uh, they think they have something special going on in Cleveland right now. How do you feel about the new tick, the new ticket policy with the Ravens, where you have a credit card that gets you in the games? Look, I like it. I, I think it's going to stop. It's going to stop uh, the people around the uh, the stadium from selling their tickets and uh, the scalping going on. I, I like it. I like electronics. I like uh, ease of use. 
looking forward to it. Yeah, I think it's a good, a great idea as far as like when you misplace tickets, you don't have to worry about that anymore. It's just yeah, like I think, you, it's, I think it's fabulous. You bring the credit card and you're there. Dennis, what's going on at Coons these days? How's the inventory stacking up? Inventory is, uh, what did they say? Uh, stack them high and uh, watch them fly, sell them cheap. That's what we're doing. Uh, we have so much. You, you know, you see the inventory that we carry. And it's, it's great because it pressurizes us internally to move it, Bruce. You know, it's one thing to stock the shelves. It's a whole different skill set and dynamics to sell it. So uh, we're excited. The zero percent for 72 months by Ford Motor Credit. We have a ton of pre-loved uh, vehicles on the lot. It's just a great time to come out and buy. And, uh, you know, Saturdays and Fridays, Bruce, we have more people in our showroom from out of state than in state, if you can believe that. I was there uh, maybe a couple Saturdays ago, and you we were showing – People were there coming there from all over. You're picking them up at the airport. You're doing every, everything conceivable. But uh, as they say, you find a way to get it done. Yeah, it's really special and uh, great uh, Great uh, with the repeat and referral business. Thanks to our advertising on your shows and all the stuff that we do. So we do appreciate our clients that are out there. They're always pushing uh, business our direction. Dennis, with that, we got to head to the break. Again, tomorrow you'll be on the Sunday Sports Voice at uh, – Four, three o'clock, correct? Yes, sir. Three to five, and of course, uh, we always have you there at four thirty with with your savvy expertise on all things that are turps. And of course, we will we will catch up with the Orioles. Then hopefully, the deal will be done by then, and uh, pretty soon we'll start talking. U- Texas, the University of Texas opening day for the Terrapins should be exciting. Did you see this, Sean Elliott, the uh, you know the safety from the Terps? He he bashed that coaching staff. Uh, on Twitter today, it's unbelievable. If you haven't seen it yet, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. Yeah. Right. Take, take a take a look at it. It's a pretty it's pretty funny. All right, my friend. All right, Dennis. Thanks a lot for checking in, my friend. Be well. Go Ravens. Go Terps. All right. This is Bruce Posner. You are listening to Coons for Terp Talk this Wednesday night and every Wednesday night here on CBS Sports Radio thirteen hundred. Coons for Terp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. All right, welcome back here to segment three of Coons Ford uh, Turp Talk. Right now, I want to tell you about Dr. Jeffrey Gaber and Gaber and Associates. The practice specializes in internal medicine and orthopedics. Gaber and Associates has two great locations in Baltimore City, next to Mercy Hospital and in Pikesville. Gaber and Associates now has the nasal swab test for quick diagnosis of influenza A and B, as well as a strep throat swab test. Remember, it's not too late to get the flu shot. It's never too late. Other available vaccines are for tetanus, shingles, pneumonia, and HPV. Check out the web uh, the website at www.drgaber.com. Remember, call Gaber and Associates at 410 410- 653-8840 for the Pikesville office and 410-986-4400 for the Baltimore City office. And don't forget also his partner, Dr. Jonathan Gitter, super guy, super doctor. All right, let's get out the phones right now. We'll talk to my good buddy, Wayne Viner. Wayne, it's Terp Night at uh, the Bayhawks game on Saturday night. I know you and the boys will be there. Yep, 21st, been on the calendar for a long time. You got your, well, I guess you want to call the Charlotte Terrapins are coming in, Bruce. A lot of your favorites. Yeah, my guys are coming in. Of course, we got Timmy Rotance and uh, and uh, Matt Rambo and Dylan Maltz is on the squad. And uh, Mike Chanichuk, who really, a real instrumental guy in moving the Terps forward. Did you know that he transferred from Princeton, Wayne? No, that didn't really connect. I know that Henry West, I think, came in from Cornell. Right, no, but, but I, Matt Chanichuk, uh, that's when you first really got started. I was thinking about that. Uh, yeah, he transferred from Princeton. And uh, what a player he was and is now. And, of course, Team Maryland is doing great at the uh, World Cup games, uh, led by Jesse Bernhardt and Drew Snyder and uh, Jeremy Sieverts and... Uh, USA has just been running away with everything except they had a struggle with Canada. And that championship game, Wayne, will be on Saturday morning at 3 a.m. Do you like that time? I like. I guess you're going to stay up for that. I think so I'll I up. noticed in watching the tournament that I guess the weather, the turf, however you want to say it, that turf 
is dry but slippery. Yes. And it would create an odd situation. A lot of the, I saw a lot of Team USA slip down, but in the absolute key moments, uh, Paul Rabel just uh, did an ankle breaker on the Canadian defenseman and scored what's got to be one of his highlight goals to yeah. take that game in the last minute. But that was one heck of a game the other day. It sure was, and we're talking about uh, one goal and four assists for Rabel. Rabel's been incredible, as he always is, actually playing midfield and just kind of directing the offense and doing it so well. But I think the star of the team so far has been the goalie, John Galloway. He has been, I, I as far as I can see, I'm not sure how a goalie could play better. And his clearing passes go back to me to uh, Jesse Schwartzman, who I always thought was the best. But uh, Galloway is just turning it into an offense. And Nico has, too, to tell you the truth. But uh, great night for Maryland sports. That's Saturday night at the Bayhawk game. And they got all kinds of things going on. So it should be a blast. But most important, it's Terp Day. Uh, and I think Terp, if you can show you're a Maryland grad or whatever, I think there is uh, discounted tickets. Well, so, we have the discounted tickets. Uh, and I expect that they'll probably have their ten or 12,000. Probably the big crowd for the year. And then the following Saturday is the last home game of the season. And you can read all about that on In the Crease Lacrosse. Todd Carton has been all over the Bayhawks. Diligently, season. diligently and covering them. And, uh, he's pretty good at it. Yeah, he's very good at it. Wayne, so, I, of course, you know I went to the All-Star game yesterday. And uh, I tell you what, I know you're not a big fan of the Nationals, but I, got, I love the National Park. I think it's fantastic. And I think that the access and egress is pretty darn good. Of course, I got there real early. I might have left a little bit too early. But uh, it was certainly no problem. And just hundreds of restaurants around the stadium. I mean, there's really a lot to do beforehand and afterwards. And uh, sight lines with only 43,000 people were great. The game, nine strike, I mean, nine walks, 25 strikeouts and 10 home runs. It's kind of like what the game of baseball is becoming. And I'm not so sure that's good. All right, and uh, there. I think it was different watching guys like Scherzer. I mean, he, these elite pitchers and the super elite batters pretty much playing a game of either I'm going to strike you out or you're going to hit a home run. That's interesting. It's not as interesting when it's a mid-level pitcher against a 220 hitter. But last night was pretty riveting. Yeah, I'm thought, not big on the game. Yeah, I'm not either. But of course, you know, it might be the last one around here for a while. And I had a, I thought I had a Chris Davis sighting yesterday, but it turned out to be Bri, uh, Bryce Harper. What is wrong with him, Wayne? You know, you're talking about guys hitting about is it 212, 212 at the moment? 212, yes. But he well, strikes out a ton, and he had his moment. That home run derby, I hope that isn't the career moment no. for him because he has a lot of talent. But that was a, a big moment. You think that maybe being in the home run derby will lead him to a better second half of the season. Well, look, he still has a lot of home runs and a lot of RBIs, but you can't bat 212 and be considered one of the best players in baseball. That title belongs to the one and only Mike Trout. And he is, he's just great. He is just great, Wayne. This is year in, year out, day in, day out. Mike Trout from the Angels. It really goes under the radar. He's not a uh, real, like, uh, attention-getting guy, but he should well, be. He should be. That's probably that's baseball fault. I mean, if he was on the Red Sox or the Yankees, he'd be the biggest star out there. Now, how baseball can't figure out how to market a guy who plays in Disneyland and the baseball lets him stand on the radar. They have to find a way to promote their stars who aren't in a Dodger uniform, the Mets, the Yankees, or the Red Sox. Yeah, uh, hard to imagine. Meantime, uh, Todd would like this little piece here, uh, this story. And that, of course, is someone scored 53 points in the WNBA. Did you hear about that? Liz, yep, N NBA record, but I can't remember who it is. Liz Cambridge. I don't even know who she is. I mean, the name doesn't bring back great memories to me uh, from college. I'm sure Ty could give you her life story. But uh, uh, 53 points on any level is incredible. 
It really is. And you're not, you know, the WNBA, you're not filled with easy drill layups driving to the hole or jams or anything. You're working for every basket, hitting everything from the outside just about. But hats off to her, 53 points. I, a very competitive league. Look, the uh, person who's making the picks for the east side of the WNBA All-Star game is Miss Deladonna from the Wizards, and Christy Tolliver will probably be on her team. Yeah, well, she should be, but Deladonna's been incredible, as we always knew she would be. Uh, Wayne, uh, did you follow the World Series of Poker in the one-drop tournament? Is that the World Series of Poker that was still on when I woke up the next morning? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. It was yeah. unbelievable. That's all I can say. Unbelievable. John Sin came from almost zero all the way back to win uh, $8.8 million, defeating Tony Miles, who accused him of, uh, uh, I can't think of what the word is. It's not slow play. It's, uh, it's when you know you've got the winning hand. Slow roll, right, a slow roll. I, uh, I would have thought the word you're looking for was insomnia at now, that point. Now, slow roll, and uh, it was just a fascinating last, last hand. And then last night, the greatest poker player in the world right now, Justin Bonomo, won the uh, one-drop tournament, and he only won $10 million, Wayne. Only 10 I was watching them bet, and you see on the bottom of the screen it says what the trips are worth. And they're throwing a hundred thousand dollars and a hundred thousand dollars. Like, and I realized that at one point one of them had ten or twelve million dollars in winnings. That's a lot. Well, a uh, hundred million. It's not dollars. It's chips. It's different. There's a big confusion there. It's not a hundred, hundred thousand or a hundred million. You know, it's chips, and whoever winds up with all the chips wins the tournament. Now, I, I have to give you credit, Wayne. Last week I said to you, who do you like? To win the British Open, you responded with Dustin Johnson. I criticized it. Dustin Johnson is the odds-on favorite to win. Well, that makes it even funnier. But after you gave me some heat about it, I think I switched over to uh, Seabiscuit. Uh, so. Look out for Ricky Fowler in this one. Of course, we'll have Pat, Pat Coiner on, on the Saturday. And the one thing I wanted to tell you about last night, how to be 5,000 Royal fans there. They were everywhere. Yeah. And the biggest topic there, the buzz around the whole stadium, was what, what was going to happen to Manny. And well, that's the only real news there. But when they cut on TV to fan shots, there were a lot of number 13 jerseys out there. Oh, there were a ton. There were a ton. It was, I tell you what, it's a great time. And I think it's just a fantastic stadium. Fantastic. And well, I hope maybe we can go out there to see the Eagles. Not the football ones, but the band. They come into Nationals Park on July 26th, I believe. Tough ticket, brother. Tough ticket. Very tough. Thursday. T tougher than the All-Star game? Oh, yeah. Much, t much more expensive. Much more expensive. Even in the upper reaches. I tell you what, for only 43,000 seats, they got a lot of seats that are really high. You know? That 400 section is, is a... Uh, it's pretty up there, you know. I, I you would think they would have had to see more seats around the stadium. I was in that mid level, which I thought was fantastic. You saw, I tweeted you a picture of where I was sitting, and it was pretty darn good. And, pretty good stuff. Uh, yeah, it was a great time and well worth it. And okay. uh, before we close out tonight, I know yes. we're getting close here. Uh, Jake Wayman had a really good summer series in the Las Vegas lead for Portland. Doesn't surprise and that was me. good to see. Doesn't surprise me. And does, you know who else did? I don't know if you watched it, but Diamond Stone played pretty well for Utah. And I don't know where that's going to take him, but it uh, should be interesting. I don't think there's room for him on Utah, but he played very well. He looks like a different guy now. He looks like he should have looked before he left Maryland. And he probably would have been a first-round pick. But uh, he's all buff, beefed up and muscled up. And, uh, well, he is, uh, he is super. All right, right and now. We're about, we're about 45 days away from kickoff at FedEx Field when Texas rolls in on September 1st. So it's almost football season, Bruce. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. But, you know, apparently the, uh, the Texas defensive back, what's his name, Logan? Deshaun Elliott just trashed the Texas coaching staff today on Twitter. I mean, really trashed him because he's get, taking a lot of heat. He's uh, as a defensive back for the Ravens. Is that correct? Yeah, the Ravens. And it was all over Twitter today to tell Mason, take a look at that. Very interesting. 
So they will be back and online uh, with, with all their stuff coming up, and we'll start doing our football previews and have Bruce come out and talk about some of these old-time games. Uh, one of my favorites in Maryland opened the season in 1985 as number one, and they played Penn State. They're not going to be number one this year, but playing Texas is going to be a big game. Yeah, it is a big game, and I think you, to, to get the ratings, to get the pub, to get it all, you've got to play games like that. And uh, if by some miracle they pull pull an upset again, that would be fantastic. Uh, I think Texas is a 10-point favorite. Does that sound right? Boy, you got me again. You, you get to the end of the show and you pull out something that I just don't know. But 10 sounds good to me. We're out of time, Wayne. Thanks a lot for coming on, as always. And uh, we'll be sure to talk to you on Saturday. All righty. Talk okay. to you then. Take care. All right, everybody. Have a good week. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you Saturday morning at 9 o'clock on Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven.